Okay, so welcome everybody. On this March YouTube channel episode, this is going to be a very empowering, awakening, and inspiring episode for all of you watching. Because here with me, I have Teal Swan, who is an international spiritual influencer, public speaker, and book author who survived a severe childhood abuse. By integrating her life experience, she inspires millions of people through her social media platforms, life workshops, and seminars towards truth, authenticity, and freedom. Teal is ranked 19th on the Watkins Most Spiritually Influential Living, li living People in 2019. See her teachings on the YouTube channel Teal Swan and her official website, tealswan.com. So welcome. Teal, hi, how are you? I am good this morning. I'm covered in snow where I am, so happy. Oh yeah, it must be cold there. Freezing. Like yep. City. Oh, okay. Oh, so this is our second time talking. It's good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Yeah, I've um I've always watched your YouTube videos, all new uh, almost every new episodes. So on this um, interview right now, I've prepared some questions for you. And I really, really always have in my mind like um, a wish and an imagination where I can learn directly from you. And having this interview is an honor and a great opportunity for me to do that. <laughs> okay, so first I want to talk about one thing that I think is inevitable, but almost everyone is avoiding it all the time. It is failure. Yes. So, um, and I want to talk about redefining failure because if, you know, you know, many people have def definitions of failure as how society taught us to be, to see them as, you know, like, for example, as bankruptcy, divorce, mm -hmm. um, not succeeding or being slandered, having mental illness, being an addict whatsoever or, or whatever, right? So uh, give me your definition or first give me the societal, society's definition of failure that you used to teach your viewers. Failure. Oh, I, okay, I'm, I'm going to jump off somewhere different because this oh. is like this the, you're like yay we're going off pissed is what we call it okay so nobody can agree upon what success or failure is that's the first thing that we have to understand the reason is success as we define it is based off of our individual wants now we could look at ourselves as an individual we could also look at the collective right when you look at society as as having a definition of failure it's always about what that society sees as what they need or want, right? The opposite. Failure is the opposite of whatever they see that they need or want. So let's say that a lot of years ago, it's decided that the only way to keep societal um, cohesion is to base society on marriage, then you need marriage to last. And based off of that need and that want, now society says that is what success is. So the reason that nobody can agree on success is because everyone wants different things. And, and our wants are dictated by our society oftentimes because we want to fit in, right? This is why we adopt those. We want to be accepted. We want approval. So we adopt a lot of those societal definitions of success. But when it comes to looking at failure or success, you have to understand that first in order to break free from the construct. You have to understand that success and therefore failure is absolutely attached to what we see as something that we want. Do you understand that so far? We as an individual. Is that what both. You it's both. It's, it, it works on the microcosmic and at the macrocosmic level. So this is what, so this is why, for example, um, nobody can agree upon success at the personal level. Let's say that I have no interest in money. Okay. Let's say that I grew up rich. And I have no interest in getting money. So if you come to me and you're like, oh my gosh, I just made a million dollars today. I'm going to be like, great. That's not a definition of success. That's not success. Why do I think that? Because it's not what I want. Yes. 
Yeah. Got it. So, so at the macrocosmic level, you also have desires. We can treat a collective consciousness like it's a singular consciousness. So let's say we can we can treat um, America, right? The consciousness of American people. We can treat that as an entity. Uh -huh. Now, with that entity, you see certain desires and therefore a certain definition of success. But I can tell you that would not match the definition of success somewhere else in the world. You know, is it a, this is why we get so many culture clashes, because we have so many value conflicts in the world, right? Right. So we, you know, in America, for example, we tend to very much want financial success. Uh -huh. Or we want career success. Let's go with that one better. We want career success. We want to make a name for ourselves. Now, let's say we flew over to a Buddhist, um, a Buddhist country. Let's make it really intense. Let's go to Tibet. Now, if we went to Tibet, all of the societal values and therefore what they're wanting are around what's the benefit of the group. And the person that is celebrated is he who abandons his ego. So going for personal success in a career is not going to be something that that culture values. Therefore, it will not be their definition of success. And the reason that I'm, that I'm going into to this to such a degree in this conversation is that we tend to get so locked into how we are programmed to see success based off of what we want and what we have been taught to want, whether we want it or not, that we don't snap out of it and go, wait a minute, if no culture on earth agrees about what success is, and like even in my friend group, not many people agree on what success is, then maybe I have to back up and make this really personal, right? Very personal. What do I genuinely want? Let's make that my definition of success. Okay. Okay, so that's layer one. That's layer one of success and failure. Now let's go deeper. <laughs> okay. The reason I ask you that question, because... If, for example, I have a definition of what failure is, okay, and that's personal and that's individual, that's subjective for me, but I believe in that, that thing, that X thing is a failure for me. Okay. In order for me, if that fa failure happens to me in my life, then for me to overcome it is one way for it is to redefine what failure means for me. If it is, how do I do it without having to go to Tibet, for example? <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> okay, so one thing is that you have got to see the failure as a step on the way to success. Because ultimately, you don't know that you've 100% failed at what you wanted to achieve in this life unless you're dead. And so I see a lot of people... <laughs> what are you confused about? <laughs> what? I see a lot of people, right? A lot of people feel this sense of failure when they're not even at the finish line. Oh, so what's wrong with it? Because of the definition, right? And it's okay, right? No, 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 no. It's the def I don't actually think the definition of failure is a problem. That's why, where there's a disconnect between you and me, right? Okay, okay. It's our relationship to failure that's the problem. Right? So let's look at success, right? To succeed is to achieve what one wants. It's that simple. So to fail is to perceive that you haven't achieved what you want. But are you dead? Well, then who's to say that you're not going to achieve that? Uh, right. <laughs> so really, when we're, when we're grasping with failures, it means that something has happened that makes us feel as if we can't get to what we want. Or as if something that's happened has brought us further away from what we want. It is the separation from what we want that is causing the pain. Yes. So, so let's go where you were trying to take us when you were talking about redefining failure, right? Let's go here for a minute. Uh -huh. And I'm going to just say, this is building a different relationship with failure. Uh -huh. When we experience these things in life, we might call failures, which just means whatever happened felt like it was in the opposite direction of where I'm wanting to go. It's a chance to observe ourselves, a very powerful chance to observe ourselves. Because it always means that we're out of alignment somehow. So most people who have really, really genuinely succeeded will tell you that there is no success without those moments. It's that moment where they decided to change course. So you could see these moments of failure as this 
powerful opportunity to decide whether you're going to stay the course in the same way that you have been doing it, or whether this is essentially a universal call to action to change what you are doing, or the way that you are doing it, or the approach that you are taking, or something. So it's a stop and observe moment where you get to evaluate yourself. And, and in this way, universally speaking, when you look at failure, it is honestly, it's this big offering, not a fun one, okay, a big offering from the universe to hone your values. And by hone my values, what do I mean by this? There's a lot of clarity of purpose that comes out of failures, because in that moment, you have to say, all right, am I in a conditional relationship? with what I am doing. <laughs> you seem so confused at this conversation. I'm, I'm interested. Okay. Intrigued highly. Okay. So most people have a very conditional relationship with what it is that they are doing in their life. They only want to do what they're doing if they get to a specific end goal. And it can now, be conscious. It oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Anything can be. So it can be super subconscious. And this conditional relationship we have with what we're doing oftentimes makes it so that we're living in a, in a state where the means do not justify the ends. So if I walked up to somebody and I was like, like a singer, let's pretend it's a singer. I walk up to a singer and I say, so you've just experienced this failure, whatever it is. Maybe you, maybe you held an event and nobody showed up, right? I would, I would ask them, now, what if you knew today that you would never achieve a sold out audience in your life. It would never happen. What would you do then? Would you quit and go make pies? Would you go get a day job? What would you do? And, and it's almost like the, in a failure, the universe is kind of forcing you to look at your conditional relationship with what you are doing. Because what if you were put in that position? It's like, I'm almost nervous to answer the question for you, right? Okay. Because because it's so important for a person to decide you know, what they would do if they had no guarantee of success. And that can be one of the most powerful questions to ever ask yourself when you're in the face of failure. Okay. Wow. Here's why. For one person, the answer is I do something completely different because I don't love doing what I'm doing enough. For another person, it's like, well, that would really suck. I guess I'm going to be like, you know, an unsuccessful person in terms of the end goal for the rest of my life. But the thing is, is I love doing what I'm doing and I can't not do it. And so I'm going to have to keep doing it. And then you've ended your, your conditional relationship with what you're extending your energy towards in your life. And that is a much more powerful state of being. Because that unconditional state of being is, has some amnesty from the ups and downs of any inevitable path in life. See, so failure can be, you know, this is part of us redefining it. It can be this opportunity to look at our conditional relationship with our end goals and our relationship to what we're doing on a daily basis to get there and the way that we're trying to get there. I mean, this, this is one of those questions that can help you pivot in life and say, okay, maybe I love what I'm doing, but I definitely wouldn't do this part of it because I hate it. If I knew I'd never get to this end goal, I wouldn't be doing that, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, so let's think about that. Oh, also, also failure. Failure also helps you define what you really want. Because there's often times where people are going for, you know, something that they want, what they define as success, right? Uh -huh. And it's not what they really want. Basically, they're using whatever they're doing as a means to an end. So even in failure is this opportunity to reevaluate, remember, observe the self, to reevaluate whether it is something that you really want or to, to hone your direction closer and closer and closer and closer to what it is that you genuinely want. And there are all kinds of things that people go for that they don't genuinely want. So failure is one of those things that's like, pay attention, do not pass go, you know? <laughs> So either it gives rise to a complete correction course where you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, this is not really the direction I want to go. Let's shift course. Let's change gears. Or it's like, oh my gosh, I'm doing the thing I love more than anything. I may be doing it in a different way, but I can't not do this. And then you're just plowing forward and 
I can guarantee you success is at the end of that road. But I still, you know, I really like people to take away from this. That it, it's a little bit funny to be like, I have failed when you're not dead yet. <laughs> Why is it interesting? Whoa, okay. Okay. Well, let's continue on this for uh, to this question. You said you mentioned several times about having a con conditional relationship with our goals. Yes. Do you mean that as wrong? Because some people who are watching this might think that, well, I do. I do want to be an inspiring person because I want to get acknowledged and validated so much because I didn't get it from my parents. I need that. Okay, but if somebody, so here's the thing. If somebody wants acknowledgement and they want this validation, there may be a better way of going about it than the way that they're going about it. So being conditional towards the goal is wrong in this case. No, what we're conditional towards is what we're doing. It's not being conditional towards the goal. What we're conditional, what we have a conditional relationship with is what we are doing to get to that goal, right? Oh. Almost like, I'll give you an example. I'm only going to be a singer if I get to this place where I have a sold out auditorium. Otherwise, I have a conditional relationship with singing. I don't like singing that much. So it's basically like what you're doing is a so that. And that is what will strip your life of happiness and joy and everything in between and and it means you cannot be in your purpose. Because anybody who is square in their purpose, when they're faced with maybe I will never reach that end goal, is going to look at you in the face and be like, that sucks. I can't stop doing this. Which means they're in an unconditional relationship with what they are doing on a daily basis. And the whole reason we're concerned with success is because we want to feel good. We think that success is going to make us happy. But I've just given you the ticket to a happy life. That's to make sure that what you're doing every day is something that you like. Not not like making sure that you're bleeding as much as you can so you get to some end goal, uh, you know? Yeah. All right. So you under you I understand. understand. I get it. Okay. I get it. So I have the next question, which is if we are on that period in our lives where we're confused whether we should continue our direction to uh, the purpose that we thought was ours to have, or should we change direction? You know, the, the space in between chapters, as some people would call it, it can be a painful time period, right? How, yeah. how, do, <laughs> yeah. So how do you teach? What do you teach people? What do you tell people in navigating through those times where everything is so uncertain, uncomfortable, etc.? That you have to be, you have to actually be willing to go through the discomfort. That's the first thing. Willing to, you have to be willing to go through the discomfort and you have to fill your life with things you like doing in the moment. Because essentially what you're doing in the future is you put a big question mark. When you put a question mark in the future, there's not that strong pull towards something. And that gets really terrifying. It means that there's uncertainty relative to the future. It, you're going to have to become comfortable with that to some degree, right? Because the point of, of being in this type of a place is to question. That questioning is the only thing that's going to make your future anything worth going towards. So like I said, the only way to make that tolerable is to make sure that what you're doing in the moment feels good. And, and I'm not talking all day long. I'm talking you just got little things that you have control over that you enjoy doing in the present moment and really lose yourself in them. It's like you're you're basically parsing your day out between serious, deep, scary questioning of, of your values, of what you're wanting, of everything, why you're doing the things you're doing, all of that, just deep questioning with times where you're really focused and engaged in the simple pleasures of your life. Okay. Things you feel intrinsically motivated to do. And when you're doing those things, you got to drop this stuff. Just drop it. Of course, the, I mean, this is something that you learn. You get better and better at, when, at it when you practice it. But it's not like when you're sitting there, let's say that for me, I love cooking. So let's say that when you're like cooking, you're not thinking about these questions anymore. You've dropped it. Yeah. Yeah. You're just really in the in the food. You've got your hands in the food. You're smelling everything. You're really enjoying that aspect of life. Being in the present moment and not doing the inner work at that moment, but the inner work is still needed. Hell yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Oh, yeah. It's just that you don't want to, if you go down a rabbit hole all day, every day, you're not going to really have a life anymore. Right. And you're not going to be, you tend to suck yourself clean of energy is what tends to happen. You're not putting energy into the bank account. Yeah. So, yeah. Talking about that inner work. <laughs> well, there's uh, this two, two to not topics, but two titles, big title called shadow work and positive focus. Well, okay. I have a friend who seemed to be doing shadow work since she was, I don't know, maybe 17 years old until 30 years old. She's like addicted to counselors, to okay. therapists. She's seeing from one to another and even even counselors reject her. Uh -huh. And what I see is I think she needs to stop doing that. So can someone be too much into shadow work? Is that possible? And until yeah. it damages that person. Is a, it per a person can swing the pendulum on anything. You can have too much water. You can have too much meditation. You can have too much of anything. <sighs> But when we're doing that, we're in resistance. We're avoiding something. So if you're, if, if people are having this reaction to somebody who, let's say that they're not afraid of feeling themselves, if people are having this reaction to people who are really into shadow work, it often means they're using shadow work to avoid something. And you can feel that kind of coping avoidance mechanism in what they're doing. Wow. Oh, before that, can you explain what falls under the category of shadow work? Like what techniques? So people- yeah, sure. Okay, so shadow work, shadow work is essentially work with the subconscious mind. So anything that you are, that you don't know that you don't know, right? That's what is subconscious because you've got what you know, you've got what you know that you don't know. Shadow work is the other stuff. It's what I don't know that I don't know. It's work with it is what is not exposed to the conscious mind. Now, the problem with that is that there's a whole lot of things that are shadow work then. I mean, you can be doing shadow work by talking to a therapist. Um, there are processes that directly access the subconscious. I've got to, you've got parts working completion process, right? You've got dream work that's work with the subconscious mind. You've got stream of consciousness. Um, you've got some forms of meditation. You've got working with shamanic medicines. <laughs> you see, there's all kinds, anytime you are working with what you don't know that you don't know, you are working with the subconscious and therefore doing shadow work. Because, you know, it was Jung who essentially coined this term because the consciousness can be compared to a light, right? So the if the conscious is a light, the subconscious or what you are not conscious of is the shadow. So shadow work, work with the unconscious. It's that simple. Yes. Um, yeah. So then, then to the opposite side of that, you've got positive focus, right? Uh-huh. So when we're talking about positive focus work, we're talking about stuff like gratitude journaling. You're talking about like affirmations resourcing can also be a form of, of positive focus reframing right there's a lot of meditations what is resourcing like learning new stuff like watching like to, in spiritual teachings no no to, to resources like we we use the the word resourcing whenever you have found a need and you're experiencing or letting yourself experience that need so let's say that i am i'm hugging somebody and in that moment, I feel a sense of belonging. I can resource in that moment that sensation of belonging. That would fall under the positive focus category. Um, also, you know, you've got positive focus exercises and you've also got visualizations, which would fall under the category of positive focus. So you've got in, in spiritual practice with the categories that you just described, we've essentially got yeah. these two practices, oh. which are, there are many subcategories underneath both. <laughs> Okay. So would you tell people to balance between both of them or is, is the right question would be who is positive focus for, who is shadow work for, or uh, go back and forth between the two and just know your limits. I would tell people that trying to achieve balance is never going to work. <laughs> um, okay. okay here's ask for we cannot ask like please tell me the answer no this is what i'm gonna say i'm not gonna i'm not gonna leave it obscure for you okay, okay. what i would say is that the relationship between yourself and shadow work and yourself and positive focus has to be the relationship between yourself and two tools they are nothing more than tools 
So you just want to figure out in any moment, what is the right tool for what I am wanting? It is that simple. It's like, it's just like using a hammer or a screwdriver. You probably wouldn't use a screwdriver for this. You probably wouldn't use a hammer for this. That's your answer. But I, I will also make this more easy for you. You want, you need to make sure that, that neither your shadow work nor your positive focus is a tool of resistance. And that's where people start to get confused. It's not hard for people to figure out which tool is right unless they're in resistance and they're using that as a tool of resistance. I've got an example for you. And by the way, shadow work can be a tool of resistance to the self. Um, there's, there's, I mean, you could use it for a lot, but I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that you're using shadow work to try to fix yourself because you hate yourself so much that it's only by fixing yourself that you're going to get love, right? You're using shadow work as a tool of resistance then. Now, let's say that you're like, you know what? I just can't, I just can't look at these painful emotions. It's just, I mean, like, I'm, it's just going to consume me. I can't do it. Okay. Then your positive focus is a tool of resistance. And, and it's when we start to use these tools as mechanisms that fuel our resistance that we get ourselves into a whole lot of trouble and they start to not work. See, if it, like, for example, let's say that you're using shadow work as a tool of resistance to the self because you're wanting to use it to fix yourself because you've already judged yourself as so wrong. So it's essentially a tool of violence, right? Wow. If you're using it that way, then it will backfire. Your shadow work is because you're going at it with this attitude of, I hate the self will result in more self-hate. Now, if you start to, to use this avoidance mechanism of positive focus, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using it to just deny, 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 the world is awesome, right? Then what starts to happen is the universe starts to close you off in a mirror. So pretty soon you get nothing but negative reflections, negative reflections, and then it's like, how good are you going to get at reframing? <laughs> because whatever you resist pers persists. So that in that case, that would be negative events happening around this person until they're like, you know, I, I can't anymore. That's an example. So both shadow work and positive focus is essentially a tool that you could either use for yourself or against yourself. You could either use it as a tool that's beneficial or a tool of resistance. Uh -huh. And and really becoming good at using those tools is to is to recognize when you are in resistance. Okay. Yeah. And that shows up in, in people's bodies as specific in a specific way. Like you can become attuned enough to your body to know when you're in resistance based off of the sensations that are occurring. Resistance is going to feel the opposite of that open, expansive love. It's going to feel like you're trying to go away from something. You can feel the away movement in your body, right? If I was to come towards you with like a really gross smelling something, you would be, your body would automatically do it. You would get a, a, a physiological sensation of, eh. okay, so you get that in your body. You also get the closing instead of that like really big, open, expansive feeling. You get the, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, it, so if we become attuned to the way that we are, to the sensations occurring in our body, we can start to recognize what that flavor of resistance is in us. And then we start to recognize it. And then it's like, wait, 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 hold the phone. Whatever I'm about to do is resistant in nature. <laughs> this is the first time I, I discover that what, what many people or some people think as healing work could actually be feeding our oh, resistance yeah. toward, towards ourselves. Hell yeah. So what is, is it like one cure for all, or is it a unique thing for every person? Like how to heal self-hate or self-loathe, the, the tool? Are we ask, asking specifically about self-hate? Yeah. Oh, there's one answer for that. Oh. So self-hate is actually a protector. Oh, I know. It's so good when you get this. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. Okay. So, so let's go back to childhood. In our early childhood, what we need as children more than anything in the universe is approval from the people around us. The reason is, is that approval equals social cohesion. We are a relationally dependent species. If I go and I put a baby out on the sidewalk, it is dead. That means we're completely dependent on the people around us. 
That means connection is the number one human need. So we have all kinds of mechanisms within ourselves that seek to maintain that social closeness. And believe me when I tell you, we prioritize this far before food and water. Mm -hmm. Far before. So knowing that, in childhood, when we are met with any kind of rejection. Now, I need people to understand that this can start before birth. If you are in a mom's tummy and that mom does not want you, you're already bathing in the vibration of rejection. Rejection is perceived as being pushed away, direct affront to what it is that we need for our survival. Everything depends on the opposite. So what we do in order to survive is we push ourselves away. The only way that we can achieve this is by splitting our own consciousness. Setting that aside, have you heard of triangulation? Yeah. When you For people who haven't, when we triangulate, we essentially seek to establish closeness with somebody by pushing somebody else away. So let's say that you and me are friends and we have another friend. So there's three of us, right? And I want to get close to you. I may be like, you know, that friend of ours, I don't think they appreciate you as much as they should. I mean, it's not fair. What they did to you is just like awful. Don't you think so? Now, right now, what I've done is I've created a an, an enemy, a common enemy to establish closeness with you. That's triangulation. And what we achieve is an internal triangulation, whereby when we are rejected as children, we seek to establish closeness with the people who rejected us by pushing the part of ourselves away that they reject. The part that is doing the pushing away, the self-hater, is a protector. It's trying to keep you safe by establishing closeness with the person you are the closest to and need to be the closest to by pushing ourself away. So, it, And there are many parts within the self that are inverted. We call it inverted because they're powerfully for you but it doesn't seem like it because they seem self-sabotaging. So self-haters are protectors within the personality spectrum that are trying to keep us safe by pushing us away so as to establish closeness with the people who would reject those very same traits in us. That's why nobody hates themselves for the same thing. We hate ourselves for what we were rejected for. It's a direct mirror of the external. So it's a protector. Is a protector. So it's really down to working with that protector, which we can easily do with parts work. <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh, uh, I have this. Uh, I heard you say this several times, like partially here, partially there. It's about, I think it's about healing ourselves so we can be in a, no, it's about need. If you said somewhere, if we have a need of closeness, connection, and we are, we, for example, we grew up lonely, then some people or some teachings will tell us to then learn to be alone, find yourself in solitude. But you, if I'm not mistaken, you said that, no, get, go get your needs met. Yeah, I said that, no, I mean, the thing, here's the thing. Closeness that you, yeah. So what, what, what is your answer to that? Okay. So it's not wrong to want to have someone close. Hell no. Okay. I am on an absolute mission around the world to try to get people to stop resisting their own biology. I, I need people to understand how nuts they sound. Because if you were to come down to earth as an extraterrestrial species to study different species on the planet, it would become obvious to you what these different species need to thrive, right? Okay, jellyfish needs water, right? A group species absolutely needs other members of its group. This is not confuse people relative to other species. We're over here, part of the humane society, yelling at people who have dogs who are stuck in backyards by themselves because we know that is not natural a dog needs a pack what is our issue with ourselves then my friends because a human is a group species they are dependent on each other the number one need for a human is connection more than food and water 
So if we're going to walk around and be like, we need to learn to be alone, my answer is, hell no. You need to stop, define your own biology, start embracing what your needs are, and get them met. But the thing is, is that the spiritual field is absolutely full, total, like full warning, completely full of people who are relationally traumatized. Oh. <laughs> what are you going to turn to if the people in your life fail you? God is the answer. So basically, you've got a whole group of people teaching who are so relationally traumatized in terms of relationships with other people that they turn to the spiritual dimensions. Something they have more control over than these other people in their lives who are acting like complete a-holes, okay? So basically, all of their teachings revolve around the coping mechanism that they themselves found for the pain in their relationships. Now, this is not to say that, that spending time alone with the self is not a beneficial tool for a person to have. Some people are so afraid of themselves that they can't stand a second alone. That's a whole different teaching. We're not talking about that. We're talking about these spiritual teachings that, that somehow it is a progressed state of being to not need anyone and to, and to embrace your aloneness in life. And I'm saying, hell no, that's a coping mechanism for relational trauma. And this is, I mean, if we continue this way, we're not going the right way for each other. Human beings need to learn relationship, right? And especially right now, you're watching it right now. I mean, we're just hiking towards war right now, you know? And that is a failure to have relationship. So people need to learn relationship. They need to get their needs met in relationship. That means that if they if they lack belonging, go find belonging. That's why if you're if you're sitting there and you're listening to people teach you about how you need to learn to be alone, you need to learn to be that all the resources you need are from within, you will feel an internal hell no. You're going to feel like I should, but it's going to feel like inside you are cracking. That's the indication that it's not the direction you need to go. That's like you're starving to death and I walk up to you and I'm like, sweetie, you need to learn how to not need food. Yeah. It's actually abusive, which is why you see me getting so heated right now. Yeah. It's abusive. People really need to hear this because it's a very common advice from like friends, from counselors to just learn to be alone. You need to I'm aware. One, stop, stop having a boyfriend for once, be single for quite a long, longer time than usual, whatever. But they don't know the core issue that that person is experiencing. Okay, so this <laughs> is. This will be um, the last question for you today, Teal. Oh, we're it already lost. Okay. Um, so um, I used to see myself in the past as a personal growth junkie, and I was so proud of it. Woohoo! I'm so cool. I'm a I'm a proud nerd of personal growth, and then at some point. Because of some experience, I decided to say no to any direction, di direct, like like a direction for me from uh, external sources. You know, I wanna, yeah, I wanna learn to know what my purpose is. So, from what I can remember, a lot of spiritual teachers would tell their listeners to want more in life, to ascend, oh. to be more, love more, share more, achieve more, 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 more. Okay. Now, I want to ask you, what about polarity? Because you taught, you teach your, your followers to learn about polarity and accepting that it is, will always be, it, it's going to always be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what should be our, what should be the aim in our lives? Is it accepting polarity, which sometimes is up and down, up and down, and it's always going to be like that? Or should we aim, aim for ascension? <laughs> I, I don't see them as mutually exclusive. I, I don't get that. I'm sorry. For me, it's like you just talked about two things that are quite compatible and as if they're not compatible. Huh? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Oh, so you can you're saying that we can do all of it? 
Yeah, yeah. So they're not like against each oh, other? No. They're not, they not inherently. Can we make them be against each other? For sure. But they're not inherent enemies. No. Um, How do I, why do I see them as enemies then? Huh, it's interesting. What's, okay. You see them as enemies because so many people use these spiritual practices as an attempt to get out of pain. And they have, they have defined life as pain. And so they're in resistance to the process of life. So here's the thing. Let's take you. So a lot of these concepts originated with Buddha, the ones you're talking about. So we have to go back to his original teachings. Okay. okay. You know that, right? I didn't know that it was from Buddha. I don't even know that. Yeah. These one, these ones that, that, that it's a truth of the universe, but they were originally brought to humanity by Buddha. And, and when you're reading and hearing about a lot of these teachings, that's essentially where you got to trace them back to. Okay. So like, let's look at this being, um, before his enlightenment, he realized that, that there was extremes in life. Mm -hmm. What I call contrast, right? I've been teaching this with the word contrast. The reason is that you've got, you know, black and white is contrast, you know, so negative and positive is contrast. Wanted and unwanted is contrast. Contrast is an inevitable element of life. Now, it is this contrast, right, the negatives and the positives that coexist next to each other. Moments of absolute joy juxtaposed to moments of absolute despair that makes life so difficult for people to navigate because we want to hold on to the positive. We don't want to experience the negative. Of course, you would have no context for understanding one without the other, but that's another subject. So, so he understood this, this concept of polarity of contrast he understood also that if you swing the pendulum to either extreme there's a problem like there was a moment where he was watching somebody who was playing a guitar and he realized that if this musician pulls the string of his guitar too tight it snaps but if it's too loose it won't play so he started to develop at this point in his his um, rather long <laughs> journey towards enlightenment he developed this concept of the middle way which is that you cannot swing the pendulum to either extreme and be in a state of health. He was perfectly accurate about that. Uh -huh. okay. So what we have here is a relationship to what we call the samsara waves, right? Samsara waves up and down. Okay. And down. Now, what he ultimately sought was a way out of the cycle. Now, this is what a lot of people want. We want, and this is just to change one's relationship to the contrast, right? Now, he experienced an enlightenment. Now, we could say that he got out of the samsara waves, but he did not, okay? That's the misunderstanding. There is no getting out of the samsara waves. Okay. What there is, is developing a different relationship to them. So you do not experience them in the same way, and that is a kind of transcendence. Uh in order to do that, you cannot be in resistance to the wave itself. So genuinely enlightened people, they're not above the waves, right? They've found a way to have a different relationship to the waves of life so that they're not in resistance to them. And this gives them a quality that is almost like they've sunk beneath the waves. They haven't. They're actually going through the waves, but because they have a different relationship to it, it's like they're grounded in something deeper and much more still. So I, I actually see these, the acceptance of contrast, which is not going to stop. And there's reasons for that. You can ask me about that later if you'd like. <laughs> um, if we have this different relationship to them, meaning we accept that they're never going to stop, then we stop trying to get out of the water, right? And so many spiritual practices that you have been introduced to are an attempt to get out of the water, mm. not an attempt to become better at surfing. <laughs> so we could call transcendence genuine transcendence is to develop a different relationship to the contrast in life you can absolutely do that now it's not like buddha after his enlightenment looked at you in the face and said the point of life is to transcend life in fact he's very famous as, as saying before he died i could stay here for another million years i could also die he was not in resistance to death, nor was he in a resistance to life. Wow. 
But a great many people take these types of teachings and they distort and twist them, right? If I am in pain in life, and let's face it, most people find their way to spirituality, especially these self-growth processes, because they are in so much pain. How can you not be in resistance to life? Okay, so they're in resistance to life, and they finally found their way out of pain, but they make an enemy of life at the same time, and therefore contrast. I see. Wow. This is very powerful, Seal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity for another interview. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. um, I actually wanted to ask one more last question, if that's okay with you. And fine, go for it. You know, I love this. Okay. Um, how do I formulate it into a sentence? Is honesty for, for you as a spiritual teacher, this could be uh this is not in the script that I sent to Corina, your assistant. Okay. So as a spiritual teacher, I genuinely want to know is being honest and showing vulnerability to your followers, being real, essential to you. Is it like one of your goals in doing what you do? I'm actually in a complicated relationship with that. I'm going to be very honest with you right now in telling you that I have a complicated relationship with this. The reason is, is that I need people to get to the place where they are honest and authentic because you cannot work with what is not real. And honestly, this is my biggest issue with where society is headed right now. I don't know if you've noticed, but society is going in the direction of this performatively woke, super politically correct type of society. And I'm telling you that is the opposite direction from honesty. Honesty and authenticity is absolutely necessary if we are to work with anything real. I have got to get people here. So in the beginning of my career, my thought was I'm gonna lead the way by doing it myself. Because if I don't do it, then people make an enemy of what's real about themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm walking a tightrope here. Mm -hmm. Because other spiritual teachers, many of whom I've had very long conversations with about this, mm -hmm. looked at me in the beginning of my career and said, don't do that. It's absolute career suicide. Because a physical human has no capacity to hold dichotomy. They expect a certain thing of their spiritual teachers, and if you do not fit that mold, they will not listen to what you say. So you have to make a decision about what matters more. Is it the content you're teaching? Or is it you being vulnerable and throwing yourself out there as an example with which they will do the worst with it? Now, in the beginning of my career, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give humanity a chance, a chance, actually. I'm just going to throw myself out there. I'm going to teach them what authenticity and honesty is. I got exactly what they said was coming for me. Humanity could not swallow it. There were a select few that could. Mm -hmm. There were a few people who were ready for that, who could definitely hold dichotomy, who held it in themselves, who were ready to step into that, that form of development within the psyche. Mm -hmm. Not most people. Most people... If you do not fit the exact mold of what they have in their head for what you should act like, they will not listen to a word you say. So where I am with that right now is a mix. I'm no longer sharing all kinds of things about my personal life publicly because people can't listen to that and actually listen to what I have to teach at the same time. I'm also not going to the place where I'm going to lie to people or put up a facade. So what you're watching in me and my answer to your question is I am on a tightrope right now between baby stepping people in that direction. And yes, with my own leadership by virtue of being an example there and also not because people are so not ready to embrace their own dichotomy and therefore they will not embrace it in anyone external to them. Teal Swan, I really 
want you to know how much I appreciate your existence, your teachings, your truth, your life experience, your sharing, your contents, you. Thank you. <laughs> and every part of you and as a whole. Thank, thank you, you for everything. Thank you for this chance for talking to you and this interview today. Thank you.